All right. Good morning. I'd like you, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10, and we're going to be considering the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. So beginning in verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out and to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And the Lord of God will indeed bless the reading of his precious word. So we're considering the millennium, uh, Revelation 21 through 10. And I want to just say that this is a very hot, hotly contested portion of Scripture. Not because it's difficult to understand, not because its meaning is not plain and simple, but because sometimes when people go to the Scriptures, they have agendas that drive their interpretation. And so as a result of that, there are those that hold to very different views to that which I'm going to be teaching this morning. And we'll talk about some of these views in a moment. But where do we get this idea of the word millennium? Well, we get it from this phrase, a thousand years, that's mentioned seven times in these few verses. And so we saw it in verse two, it says, uh, he bound him a thousand years, speaking of the devil. And he just goes through and it repeats it again and again, a thousand years, thousand years, thousand years. And so uh, the word millennium is really the Latin for a thousand years. And so from the Latin, mille is a thousand, and annum is years, and you put them together, you get a compound word, which is our word millennium. And we might say a thousand years of what? Uh, the um, Puritan, uh, John Milton, wrote an epic work called Paradise Lost. And he tells of a world plunged into the effects of the curse because of the sin of the first Adam. The millennium will be paradise regained as a direct result of the victory of the second man, the last Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so some of the, the wonders and beauty of the uh, the precursed world will be restored during that thousand years of reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me just go through the three views, the three prominent views concerning this portion of Scripture, concerning the millennium. Of course, the view that we're taking is what we call premillennialism. And the idea of that is simply this, that Christ returns to the earth prior to setting up the 1,000-year reign. So that's why we say pre-millennial, that Christ's return is before the millennial reign of Christ. Um, he comes, he conquers his enemies, 
he sets up the kingdom, he reigns for a thousand years. And the scriptural evidence for this position is absolutely overwhelming. And let's just give you one example where Christ comes, conquers, and then sets up a kingdom. Look at the book of Daniel and chapter 2, where it's spelled out very, very clearly. Uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 44 and 45, where we read this. And in the days of these kings, this is kind of the, the, the world empires that have been described in this vision Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces, the iron and the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. And so the idea is this, that the, the kingdoms of the world that were described, the various empires, ultimately are going to be crushed by this stone made without hands. That's the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, when he comes back to the earth, destroys those kingdoms, and then sets up a kingdom that will never end. So it will have a thousand years here on earth, and then we'll go at the end of the thousand years into the eternal state, and Christ will reign forever and ever and ever. And so that's the, the view of premillennialism, which we're going to be espousing from this passage. And it's the oldest view. It was held unanimously, without exception, by the early church in the first three centuries of church history. There was no other view in the first three centuries of church history. And, of course, the, uh, look at the book of Acts for a moment. The disciples certainly believed that there was going to be a restoration of the kingdom for Israel that was going to uh, have great effects on the planet. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, it says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? In verse 70, he says, he said unto them, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons, which the Father has set in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. So what the disciples are asking is, Lord, you've, you've risen from the dead. Um, are you going to, at this point, set up the kingdom, restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, he didn't say, now, don't be so carnal. This is a silly idea. He didn't dismiss their idea at all that there would be a restoration of the kingdom to Israel. All he said is, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. And the implication is that in the proper time and the proper season, the kingdom will be restored to Israel. But at this moment, it's not the time or the season. It's the time to evangelize the world. And of course, that's our job right now beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, going to the ends of the earth. And so certainly the disciples expected the kingdom. They knew he would establish it. And they knew that uh, through his answer, that there would be a time and a season when this will happen. We believe there is a time and a season. Well, it will definitely happen. Now, this view because of the rise of amillennialism, and we'll talk about that in a moment, it kind of fell into um, unpopularity uh, for centuries. Uh, was not the, because the Catholic Church dominated, if you remember, throughout the Dark Ages. And so for centuries, uh, with, with one or two exceptions in church history, the prevailing view was amillennialism. But the view was revived, um, particularly... In 1825, John Nelson Darby was uh, involved in a, an accident. He fell off a horse, and uh, he uh, was uh, in a lot of pain, and he went to a dark room in his sister's house and uh, didn't have a lot that he could do, and he was meditating on Scripture, and he was meditating on Isaiah chapter 32. And as a result of his meditation, he came to the conviction that Israel would be restored in that scripture clearly taught that there would be a thousand year reign of Christ. And so Mr. Darby uh, was the one who certainly 
uh, revived that position, although others have held it in between. Uh, the early church had the first 300 years and Mr. Darby, but he was the one who really popularized it by his extensive travels, his prolific writings, and his excellent teaching. However, it was picked up in the U.S. by a guy called um, C.I. Schofield, and he wrote the Schofield Reference Bible, by the way, which is an excellent Bible. <laughs> I would certainly heartily recommend it. And as a result of the Schofield Reference Bible, it became popular much wider than in assembly circles. It became the prevalent view, basically, uh, in the evangelical church and uh, certainly was that way uh, until recent times. Just to say this, there are, there are over 400 verses in more than 20 different passages in the Old Testament, which deal with this thousand year reign. Now, it might not mention thousand years, but it talks about a time of paradise restored. And we'll look at some of the scriptures as we go on today, but over 400 verses, 20 different passages. It, it, basically, if you reject this position, I don't know what you're going to do with a whole lot of scripture <laughs> that just makes no sense unless you take it in its plain meaning that there will be a thousand year reign of Christ. And of course, we do believe the Lord Jesus will reign over this planet for a thousand years, and it will be the golden age of planet Earth and, and a time of rest for the Earth from all right now creations groaning and travailing. It will be a time of peace and rest for the Earth for a thousand years. And again, just as the, the creation originally was a six-day creation on the seventh day was a day of rest, many believe that Earth's history will be 6,000 years, and then the final thousand years will be this Sabbath rest for planet Earth, this millennial reign. So let's look at some of the other views very quickly. A, millennialism. A means no in the Latin, and so the idea is uh, no future millennium. Uh, they believe, the amillennialists, and this is, by the way, the majority position, because it's the view of the Catholic Church and the Reformers when they came out of Catholicism, uh, their battle was the gospel. It wasn't prophecy. And so they just adopted the Catholic view of eschatology, of end times. And so amillennialism dominates the Reformed world. And so they believe, and this is their view, that we're in the millennium now, that Satan was bound at the cross, and that Christ is reigning, and the saints with him in heaven ever since that moment. Now, of course, there are lots of difficult verses if you're an amillennialist. For instance, it talks about the lion laying down with the lamb. And if you really are convinced of amillennialism, try going to the zoo and sticking your head into the lion's cage and see if we're really in the millennium right now. And I think you'll find we're not. <laughs> uh, you will lose your head. Uh, I think in one sense, you've already lost your head if you've embraced this position because it's so difficult to sustain from scripture. It's based on spiritualizing prophetic scriptures instead of taking them literally. And the spiritualization method of scripture, rather than taking the plain sense uh, at its at face value, it was brought in by the Alexandrian school, Alexandrian Egypt. And there was a teacher called Origin of Alexandria. And he was the man who developed this method of interpreta interpretation of the scriptures in the fourth century. That's why, by the way, a good knowledge of church history will be very helpful for you to know about these things. Yeah, his view uh, of uh, spiritualizing the word of God was popularized by Augustine in his work, The City of God. And of course, there's a reason for that. Why, why was this work, The City of God, uh, prevalent? Well, because Rome, it was written when Rome was was falling apart at the seams. It was it was being defeated, and uh, kind of uh, the Roman kind of church uh, was backed by the Roman Empire. Constantine, remember, he had embraced Christianity, and and now this uh, this Rome is is collapsing. What now? And so the city of God was a book written to kind of 
basically uh, explain what was going on at the time, at least attempting to, uh, by Augustine. I want to just say a few things about Augustine quickly. He has the dis dubious distinction of being the major brain behind Roman Catholicism and its sacramental system, uh, involve, enforcing uh, religious views by the state, you know, the Inquisition. Um, uh, he he was very opposed to premillennialism. Premillennialism, and the reason was that the premillennialists basically believed that the the re revived Roman Empire would provide the Antichrist. And so when Constantine embraced Christianity, it became a bit of an embarrassment because the Roman emperor is now the head of the church. And so if you hold this premillennial view, it's very uncomfortable because you actually have the potential Antichrist being the head of the church. And so they had to come up with an alternative view. By the way, according to Sir Robert Anderson, and by the way, I heartily recommend if you if you can read books by Sir Robert Anderson, it'll be food for your soul. But he believed that every error in the church can be traced to Augustine. He has no lover of Augustine, and I agree wholeheartedly with him. Not only did Roman Catholicism come from him, extreme predestination, Calvinism, comes from that same source, Augustine, and also this amillennial system. And it is the dominant view in the world today. And if you've ever sat under ministry, and I have, from amillennialists, let me tell you, it's absolutely confusing. I remember thinking to myself as a young Christian, listening to amillennialists expound the scripture, thinking to myself, I could never be a preacher. I had no idea where they were getting this stuff from. I looked at the passage. It made no sense whatsoever because it was all spiritualized. Now, the third viewpoint, post-millennialism, it's important we talk about this just for a minute. It was made popular by a man called Daniel Whitby in the 17th century. And who was this man, Daniel Whitby? Uh, he was a Unitarian. Uh, that means that he uh, he didn't believe in the Trinity. Uh, he believed in just uh, the unity of God. There was only one God, not distinct in three persons. And so uh, he came up with this view of post-millennialism based on the optimism of the British Empire. Uh, you see, the, the empire was spreading around the world, and wherever it was, it was civilizing the world, but it was also bringing the gospel, which is true, and you can see the effects of that uh, throughout the world even to this day. And so the, this optimism, there was this sense that the world would be converted, and it would usher in a thousand years of peace on the earth. And after that thousand years of gospel peace brought in by the spread of the gospel, Christ would return at the end of the thousand years. However, this optimism was shattered by the First World War and then quickly followed by the Second World War. And so it became a very rare viewpoint. However, I want you to know this, that it actually has become uh, the most uh, fastest growing view on end times at our current moment in history, primarily through the homeschool movement and an extreme segment of the homeschool movement that is very reformed. And what their belief is this, we will raise the lawyers, the politicians, the intellectuals to retake the Western world for Christ. And we'll bring in the millennial reign of Christ. Very optimistic, highly critical of premillennialists. They call us pessimists because we talk about it getting worse. They say, no, it's going to get better. Some key names to look out for, Rush Rush Dooney, Gary North, Gary DeMar, one you would know of, R.C. Sproul, and then one you might not know of, but this guy is really influential, Douglas Wilson. Uh, he uh, writes a magazine called Credenda Agenda, very big in the classical homeschool movement. And so these people pushing this post-millennial view. Now, we're just going to look at the text, and we're going to look at it from a pre-millennial view. And I want to say, why is this millennial reign necessary, this thousand years? We want to look at some reasons. First of all, to fulfill prophecy. The Lord Jesus in the scriptures is called the son of Abraham, the son of David, and the son of Adam. As the son of Abraham, he is going to fulfill the land promises that were given to Abraham and his descendants. Remember, God promised him a land. 
and and the Lord Jesus is going to give that land promise to the nation. Of, they have never fully inherited, even at the peak of Solomon's kingdom, the land that had been given to them by God had never fully been taken by them. In the millennial kingdom, it will be. And the Lord Jesus will enable them as this victorious king to fulfill the promises that were made to Abraham concerning the land. The son of David concerning the throne. David was promised that his descendants would always sit on the throne of Israel. And of course, there's no son of David on the throne right now, but a son of David is going to come and fulfill that prophecy and sit on the throne. And then the son of Adam. Adam was given dominion, if you remember. He was given dominion over the fish and the fowl and all the creatures, and, it, and he lost dominion to Satan. Christ has regained dominion, and he indeed will be the son of Adam, the descendant of Adam. God's plan was always that a man would reign on the earth for him, and that man who will reign on the earth for him will be none other than the Lord Jesus. Let's look at some scriptures quickly. And we're going to get to the text, but all this is, I think, necessary background, very, very important that we understand the battles going on over this portion of scripture and the reason why the millennial kingdom is worth fighting for and believing in, because it is so critical to the understanding of scripture. Luke 1 verse 31, Luke's gospel verse 31, it says, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and his of his kingdom. There shall be no end. Now, the Lord Jesus, up to this moment in time, has not sat on the throne of his father, David, but he will. And he's going to reign over the house of Israel. Right now, Israel is still saying, we will not have this man to reign over us, but clearly he will. And, he, and his kingdom, there will be no end. That thousand years will go into the eternal state and he will reign forever and ever and ever. Psalm 2. We've mentioned this psalm many times uh, over our study in Revelation because it's so key to understanding the book of Revelation. But Psalm 2, verse 6, we hear, the despite man's rebellion, uh, man's imagine a vain thing and, and not wanting God's rule over them, yet, verse 6 says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And so Jesus is going to be, God talks about it in the past as if it's it's already happened. I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. In other words, the prophecy is so sure that Jesus will reign on that holy hill of Zion. He's going to reign from Jerusalem. He's going to reign for a thousand years. Isaiah chapter 9. And again, these are very familiar scriptures, ones we, we know of, and yet they have yet uh, to be fulfilled in their fullest aspect. And so, for instance, um, Isaiah 9, 6, we'll be thinking about this in a, in a couple of months' time. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. And then notice this last phrase, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And wonderful to know, isn't it? The zeal of the Lord of hosts is committed to putting this child that is born, this son that is given on the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order and establish it and it's going to last forever and the zeal of the lord of hosts will indeed make sure that this happens then look at the new testament so far a lot of uh, well luke's gospel was in the new testament too but in the epistles first corinthians 15 I want us to look there and verse 24 it says but if all prophecy so that's chapter 14, 15, verse 24. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up 
the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. I want you just to get that. He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. So why is the millennium necessary? One, to fulfill prophecy. Two, to answer prayer. Look at Gospel of Luke, Luke's Gospel, chapter 11. And we know these words very well, verses 1 through 4. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of the disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in heaven as it is in earth. And so, again, just that prayer, how many times has this Lord's prayer, so-called, like really the disciples' prayer, how many times have we prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Well, it hasn't been done on earth yet, but it will be when the Lord Jesus comes and takes up that throne and reigns. Another reason why the millennium is necessary, fulfill prophecy, answer prayer, to prove that man is incurably evil. And so today, a man goes out and he robs a bank and he maybe is caught and he has to justify himself. And he says, well, I had to feed my family. We were poor. We were hungry. We had no food. He'll use excuses People fiddle their taxes. Why do they do that? Well, they say, well, the government's corrupt. And so I, I, I want to keep it for myself. I don't want to give it to them. And so they'll use lots of lots of excuses. My, I, I am the way I am because I grew up in a bad environment. If I just had a better environment, I'd be a better person. And so the Lord says, okay, I'm going to put you in a perfect environment. Paradise regained with a perfect government. The Lord Jesus himself, the one who was sinless, reigning over the earth. So you're going to have a perfect environment, perfect government, lots to eat. The tops of the mountains, it says, will be overflowing with grain. You will never be hungry. Good health. You won't be able to complain that your health is bad because this is going to be a time where a child will die 100 years old. So, so perfect conditions. And yet at the end of that thousand years, what does man do? He rebels. And what we learn is this, that no matter what conditions you put man in, he always fails the test because his heart is incurably evil. So going back to our passage now, we have to ask the question, this thousand years that's mentioned again and again, is it a literal thousand years? When we look at numbers in the Bible, we should take them literally unless there's a clear reason or evidence to do otherwise. And it's important that we have this thousand years because it will demonstrate Jesus' victory and worthiness to rule the nations. That he is uh, this righteous person uh, that is who has the right to reign uh, as, the, as the second man, the last Adam. He also um, will as we've already said, re reveal the depths of man's rebellious nature in a perfect environment. Some people think that man is basically good and just if he'd just be given the right set of circumstances, he'd turn out to be a fine chap. Well, we're going to see that at the end of the millennial kingdom, thousand years of perfection, a man is not such a fine chap after all. In fact, he is incurably sinful. And so the millennium is important because it will display the eternal depravity of Satan as well, who a thousand years of incarceration does not in any way correct his character. Remember, we talk about putting people in a correctional institute. Well, he's going to be a thousand years in a correctional institute called the abyss. And at the end of the thousand years, he will once again try to rebel against God. And so... Also, the millennium will show the invulnerability of the city of God against attack. Uh, God is going to defend his people. These are just a, a little quote from Mr. 
Spurgeon, he says, let us rejoice that scripture is so clear and so explicit upon this great doctrine of the future triumph of Christ over the whole world. We believe that the Jews will be converted and that they will be restored to their own land. We believe that Jerusalem will be the central metropolis of Christ's kingdom. We also believe that all nations shall walk in the light of that glorious city, which shall be built at Jerusalem. We expect that the glory which shall have its center there shall spread over the whole world, covering it with a sea of holiness, happiness, and delight. For this we look with joyful expectation. I wonder, are you looking with joyful expectation to that time when Jesus will reign, where'er the sun doth its successive journeys run? I'm certainly looking forward to this time. So now let's go to the passage and expound it in detail. And it's interesting that although it's dealing with the, the reign of Christ, actually very few details are given in these verses. The focus seems to be on the preparation for the reign, the events that bring it to a close, and the events that follow it in the divine program. We have to look elsewhere, these 400 passages, to get all the details to fill in. I want you to notice, too, that, that we're in a chronological sequence now in the book of Revelation uh, that is not going to go back. We're, we're moving. There's no parentheses anymore. There's no looking back. We're just going forward. And, and this forward movement, it's important we see this in the text, always begins with the phrase, I saw. So I want you to just notice uh, the, the number of times we read this. So, for instance, uh, as we go through, and so he's, he's seeing things that are basically going to take place after Christ's coming back to the earth and before the eternal state, we're going to see what he, what he sees. And so he says, verse 11, I saw heaven opened. This is chapter 19, verse 11. I saw heaven opened and behold the white hall. So that's the coming of Christ. Uh, verse 17, this is the invitation to the great supper that we talked about last time. I saw the angel standing in the sun, cried with a loud voice to the fowls, that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together. Verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together. And of course, he, he saw uh, the beast and the false prophet thrown uh, into the lake of fire. Uh, chapter 20, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit. Uh, verse 20, Chapter 20, verse 4, I saw thrones and they sat upon them. Judgment was given to them. Verse 11, I saw a great white throne. Uh, verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Uh, verse Chapter 21, verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Verse 2 of chapter 21, I, saw, I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride for a husband. And then finally, verse 22, I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And so we see these forward movements in the vision. He's kind of showing him the chronology of the end time events. Christ comes to the earth, the supper, Armageddon, as it were, the great supper of the great God, moving into the thousand year reign, moving from there into the eternal state. And all of it is a is a moving forward. No more parentheses, no more going backwards. From now on, chronological sequence to the very end. So verses one through three looks at the final opportunity for human nature. But what do we mean by that? Final opportunity for man to prove that he's not such a bad person after all. God's going to put him in this perfect environment and remove Satan from the equation. And we're going to see that this final opportunity, man does not do so well. And so verse one, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, let's just think about this. The arresting of Satan. This is not the key of Hades. The key of death and Hades is in the hands of the Lord Jesus. We see that from Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. Let me just go back there. Very important that we see that there's a distinction here. This is the key to the abyss, not the key of death and Hades. Chapter 1, verse 18, I am he 
that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and of death. That's in the hands of the Lord Jesus. But this is a key to the bottomless pit or the abyss. And so notice it says, I saw an angel. Now, I want you to notice that this angel who's going to subdue Satan by putting him into this bottomless pit, by putting a chain upon him and put him there for a thousand years, is anonymous. He's not even called a mighty angel or a strong angel. He's not Michael. He's not Gabriel. He's not any high-ranking angel. He's not the Lord Jesus uh, himself. It's just an angel. And what does that tell us? It tells us that Satan is not the big shot we've been led to believe he is. The final importance of Satan is perhaps indicated in the fact that it's not the Father who deals with him, nor the Christ, but an unnamed angel. An angel coming down from heaven is enough to subdue Satan. It, it, that's all it takes. This is a dramatic declaration. Satan is not God's opposite or equal, and that God could easily stop Satan's activity at any time. Yet God allows Satan to continue because even in his evil, he indirectly, indirectly is serving the purposes of God. So amazing, just an ordinary angel comes, he has a key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand, and he lays hold on the dragon. Now, let's think about this person, uh, Satan here. And again, he's given four names, very descriptive. The dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan. And all of them tell us something about the, the character of this individual. They're very revealing. As the dragon, he is the embodiment of cruelty. As the serpent, he's the personification of guile. You know, he's sneaky, crafty. As the devil, he's the arch tempter of man and then the subsequent accuser. He's the one that tempts us. And then when we succumb, or if we succumb, to, then he says, well, you call yourself a Christian, you know, and then he begins to accuse the brethren. And as Satan, he is the declared opponent of Christ and his people. And notice the emphasis on his binding here. So he's got this great chain in his hand, and it says he bound him a thousand years. And then in verse 3, he shut him up. This is in the abyss. And then he set a seal upon him. And so the great emphasis on the fact that, that he is incapacitated for a thousand years. The world will be relieved of Satan's power in all its evil variety for a thousand years in a sense for satan the book of revelation why he hates this book why he tells us it's too difficult to understand is because it reveals his downfall from from he's cast from heaven to earth in chapter 12 remember that he was cast out michael and his angels fought against and he's cast down to the earth then here he's cast into the bottomless pit and then in verse 10 He's cast into the lake of fire. And so for Satan, the book of Revelation tells us it's downhill all the way for him. What about the demons? Because it doesn't say anything about his demons. Satan's going to be incapacitated for a thousand years. Is there any scripture that would indicate that the demons might well be incapacitated as well during that time because today people are well they're, they're listening to the doctrines of demons and so people are being deceived so what about them zechariah has a little bit of interesting insight for us prophecy of zechariah let's go back to matthew and then just you get to malachi and then zechariah chapter 13 verse 2 it says it shall come to pass in that day saith the Lord of hosts that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land and they shall no more be remembered. Also, I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Notice that the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. And I do believe that the vast majority of the demonic hosts, remember some of them will be held in Babylon that was destroyed. Uh, it'll be the 
the the dwelling place of demons and all kinds, but they'll be kind of restricted there in that zone. But the rest of them, I believe, will be thrown into the abyss. Uh, we see in Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, when uh, the man of the Gadarenes had the demons cast out of him. The demons were anxious uh, not to th put us into the abyss before the time. And this is where they'll be put into the abyss. So where is this place where he's held? They cast him into the bottomless pit, verse 3, shut him up, set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more. We saw in chapter 9 when the abyss was opened and all these demonic demon locusts came out. And here it's shut and it is sealed. Do you remember that Satan tried to imprison Jesus in a tomb and even had the seal of the Roman Empire set on the tomb, but he couldn't keep Jesus in. Now, Satan is bound and sealed and he cannot get out <laughs> god has no difficulty restraining satan and this incarceration is to restrain him for one thousand years and so why is he restrained so that he should deceive the nations no more this shows us that satan's main mode of attack is revealed here what is he doing? He's a deceiver. And what is he doing right now? What is his activity currently? Deceiving the nations. And can't we see it? Has it never been more obvious how deceived the nations are? It's, it's just evident that, that he's doing a fabulous job of deceiving the nations. Sin, Satan's work of deception continues to this hour. Therefore, we know that it, we can't be in the millennium now because the deception of the nations is so evident. But during the millennium, he's not going to do that. And again, he, he he's bound. And look at First uh, Peter chapter 5. And again, I would just say to our millennial friends, how can you believe that, that Satan is bound? They believe he was bound at the cross. How can you possibly believe that when we read scriptures like this? Chapter 5, if he's chained, it must be a, it must be a like a an elastic band or something that has a long reach, according to a millennialist. But it says uh, in First Peter five verse eight: "Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour." Well, that doesn't sound like he's bound. It sounds like he's walking around. He's on the prowl. He's looking for whom he may devour. He said that this thousand years is mentioned seven times in the first seven verses of this chapter. This thousand years begins with the removal of Satan. It's marked by the reign of saints with Christ, and it closes with the release of Satan. Satan is to deceive the nations no more during this thousand years. This has been his habit, because it will reach its climax in the tribulation period, uh, when the nations will be so deceived that they will take the mark of the beast and they will worship the, the image of the beast. And so that's when its deception will reach its ultimate uh, fulfillment. But during this thousand years, it will not happen. So we might ask the question, is this a literal thing here, this binding of Satan? Because, again, our Amy Lenley's friends say, well, Satan's a spirit. So how? what kind of chain would bind a spirit <laughs> being? And so this is their logic. This is what they're talking about. What kind of chain can hold the devil? Uh, we don't know, but we know that God can fashion a chain for exactly that purpose. It might not be a metal one that we're familiar with, but we know that he is able to do that. And how do we know it? Well, we just look to the book that precedes Revelation and the book of Jude and verse 6. And it says, The angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains on the darkness to the judgment of the great day. So God is already chaining spirit beings these angels, which kept their not their first estate, they're already reserved in everlasting chains 
on the darkness to the judgment of the great day. If he can do that for them, he can do that for Satan. It's not a difficulty unless you have an agenda that you want to push. The elaborate measures taken to ensure his custody are most easily understood as implying the complete cessation of his influence on earth. The conquest of Satan and his powers does not come by human effort. This is God doing this. This is not man evangelizing the world and therefore nullifying Satan's influence. This is God who is doing this by the use of his angels. Now, verse 4, it says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So I want to think of the, the final vindication of the faithful, those that were martyred, they're going to be vindicated, being raised from the dead. Also, the faithful saints, they're going to be vindicated because they're going to reign with Christ. And then we want to have a little glimpse at the final age of world history. So I want to think about what will the millennium be like? And I want to talk about some of the changes. We've already talked about paradise restored. So let me talk about some of the geographical changes to begin with. And we... Uh, to begin with, we'll go back to that Zechariah prophecy, prophecy of Zechariah in chapter 14. Zechariah 14, verse 4, it says, His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, on the east in the Mount of Olives, which shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, half of it toward the south. So and immediately when Christ touches down on planet Earth, these geographical changes will begin. Mount of Olives is going to split in half, and, and it's going to be a, a massive change right there geographically. Uh, verse 8 so chapter 14, it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. So there's going to be living waters going out of the throne of Jerusalem, and it will go to the Dead Sea, and it will go to the Mediterranean Sea, a, a fork in two places. And so we always wondered, Jerusalem is a, a, a capital city, not built on a river. Well, it's waiting for its river. It's going to flow out of Jerusalem and it's going to divide up the promised land and, of course, bring great blessing. Isaiah 47 talks about uh, the the waters. Sorry, Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47 talks about the waters of the Dead Sea being healed and being a place of multitude of, of fish uh, that will swim there. And so it'll be... Uh, trans transformed and so it tells us um verse 9 of isaiah uh, ezekiel 47 of verse 8 then said he unto me these waters issue out toward the east country and go down unto the desert and go into the sea which being brought forth into the sea the waters shall be healed shall come to pass that everything that liveth which moveth whithersoever the river shall come shall live and there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come hither, uh, thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. So it's going to go down into the wilderness, and everything's going to come alive where this river comes. And and again, lots of descriptions there, but geographical changes, uh, botanical changes. Uh, look at the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. Again, the great, great changes on planet Earth. Abundance. And Isaiah 35, and we'll read verses 1 and 2. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom 
as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and, and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. So again, the desert blooming like the rose. Massive zoological changes. Look at Isaiah chapter 11. And we've already hinted at this, uh, but uh, the animal kingdom will be definitely changed in the millennial kingdom. Verse six, the wolf shall also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the wean child shall put his head on the cockatrice den. So again, if you really believe we're in the millennium now, let your children play over a snake's nest and see if we're really in the millennial kingdom. But they will be able to play in a snake's nest safely in the millennial kingdom. Changes to the human body. Uh, we've already uh, thought about this. We've quoted the, uh, a, a verse of scripture uh, without turning to it about uh, longevity. But uh, just look at Isaiah 35 verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out, streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, the thirsty land springs of water, the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. So again, eyes of the blind be opened. Now the Lord Jesus, when he came on earth, one of the evidences that he was Messiah was that he began to bring some of these things in to show that he really was the Messiah. But when he comes the second time, this will happen. And a lot of the uh, illnesses, in, invalids, all that kind of stuff, there'll be great healing. Um, Isaiah 65. And verse 20. Isaiah 65, verse 20, we read this. It says, then shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. Well, isn't that interesting? If somebody dies a hundred years old, they'll say, well, he was nothing but a kid. There'll be a sense of shock. He's so, hundred. why is he dying so young? What a shame. He's 100 years old and he's he's just a child. <laughs> Amazing longevity in that time period. And then, of course, there'll be massive changes for the nation of Israel. And, of course, they're going to be elevated. And we'll look at Isaiah chapter 2 to see if God indeed is going to restore the kingdom to Israel. What will it look like? What will this thousand-year reign be like? Isaiah 2. And we'll finish with this, verses 2 through 4. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So massive changes. Israel, they're not beating their swords into plowshares right now but they will. What a great day is coming. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen.